I've been sharing with you about about Exodus and uh, coming out. You know what God calls that? God calls that you followed me in the wilderness passionately. Israel followed God in the wilderness with passion. They might have complained. Okay, yeah, you know, we missed our leeks and onions. We, we missed the ease of life. Although they had a whip on their back. But they still passionately followed God in the wilderness. And they followed him to the mountain. And, the, and they said, yes, we will receive his word. But then something went wrong. They became very weak. While they waited for Moses 40 days and 40 nights upon the mountain, they said, we don't know what happened to him. God has abandoned us. This is something we need to remember. Though it seems like he's not there, he's even closer to us. And uh, it's interesting that this portion is read at this time because we're in the month of Adar. And the month of Adar actually means glorious, the, the song that we just sang. It's like the month literally means, uh, where we get the word adorn. You know, when women adorn themselves with, with, uh, with like, makeup and jewelry. Well, the month literally means to adorn. But yet, it was the time that Israel was in great peril where, where in the book of Esther, there was a day set for the destruction of all the people, all the Jews and all the provinces of Persia. And it was during this time, while this destruction was set, that they were waiting. And they got, but this time, in the story of Esther, they got desperate enough to get on their knees with sackcloth and ashes to pray and to fast. Okay? And <clears throat> it's like, we, we're like, you know, Israel was just waiting there. I don't know what they were doing for 40 days. We know when, when this was. We know that this started right after they received the commandments, and it lasted all the way to the 17th of Tammuz. And on this date, is this is the time that they built the golden calf. Okay, One of the worst things in all of Jewish history was that golden calf. Because they were with God. I want you to imagine this. God was right there on the mountain in, in fire, in quaking, in, in power. Okay, And you could see the cloud of glory on the mountain. And this was happening, and they were, you know, they, they, they got weak. And they said, oh, you know, where is he gone? He's up there. Aaron should have said, look up there. That's where, see that cloud? Have you no fear? Don't you think God is able, God will take your life if you rebel against it? But no. He got afraid of the people. So he listened to the people. And he mocked them even because he wanted to show that he wasn't completely in it, what they were doing. There was a rebellion going on and they were trying to say, build a calf. And then they drew all these little images of Athos, the God that they worshiped. Okay, the God that Egyptians worshiped. And they said, these are your gods, O Israel. These are your gods. These are the ones that brought you out, out you know, and they were mocking God. And you know what? There's something to learn in this. And that's what we're going to learn today. <coughs> uh, you all have your notes? I think I had enough notes for everybody. So. Um, well, we're not going to talk about the head count. <laughs> Uh, I'll tell you something about that. Um, it says here, and uh, let's look at <coughs> Exodus 30, verse 11. Okay. 
In Exodus 30, verse 11, the name of this portion is called Kitesa. Uh, and it literally means when you take. Yehovah said to Moshe, saying, when you take a head count of the children of Israel, according to their numbers, they shall give. Every man shall, shall give an atonement for his soul to Yehovah when counting them. So that there will not be among them a plague when counting them. <clears throat> now you might like think that this is not that important, but it is. I brought a part of the Torah with me. I, I copied it um, because I think it's important what the Jews have to say about this. <clears throat> Now, this is what it says here. Um, it says here, the Torah forbid counting Jews in an ordinary manner when the census is necessary. It should be done by having the people contribute items, which would be counted. In the census in the wilderness, the people rich and poor alike were to contribute half a shekel each for the construction and upkeep of the tabernacle. Israel is elevated by its contributions for charitable causes, and this is why the entire nation had to join in contributing to a sacred cause. This concept is indicated by a literal meaning of the commandment. When you elevate the heads of the children of Israel, implying these contributions were not only to facilitate a census and to provide for the tabernacle, but also to raise the level of the contributors. The equal participation of all the people symbolizes that all Jews must share in achieving their national goals, that everyone should pass through the census by giving up his selfish personal interests for the sake of the nation because the mission of Israel is dependent on the unity of the whole. Okay, so <clears throat> let me just tell you this, that <clears throat> unity... The counting has to do with giving. To be counted among the people, you give. And God was saying, what, and he was actually calling it atonement for the soul. Okay, so um, later, I don't know if you remember the story of David. When David, David did one sin, we all know about that sin. That's taught well in the church. But the other one isn't taught too well. Because I guess it's not that important. To, to many in the church. The sin that David committed, we know Bathsheba, okay, Bathsheba? I, I can't say it, but... Bathsheba. Yeah, Bathsheba, okay. That's how you say it in English, okay, but it's Bathsheba, okay? Daughter of the seven. <laughs> so uh, the, the thing is, uh, you know, what he did with her, and he killed her husband, and, and all this. We hear about that one. But well, what about the other one? Did you know that David had another major sin? It almost cost the lives of the whole nation of Israel. The sin was when he, it says here, it says in the scriptures, I think it's 1 Samuel, I might be wrong. Uh, I have the scripture in, this, in the notes here. That Satan, it literally says, Satan moved David to count the people. Now, what does that mean? It means that when God's telling Moses that you need to count the people, he says, everybody has to contribute. And he basically, he says, for their atonement. Basically, God is saying, they are mine. When David went to, to count them, he, he was saying, they are mine. When he was trying to count the people, he was in the flesh, he was being led by Satan, and he was basically saying, they are my people, not God's people. Now, he didn't see it like that, but still, he made that mistake. And it cost, there were some problems because of that. Like, uh, but you know what's funny? Out of that big error, it, it was one of, the, one of the ways David redeemed himself was purchasing the Temple Mount. <laughs> okay, so the Temple Mount is owned by Israel because of David's sin in counting Israel. Okay, now that's important. 
Because what are we talking about here? We're talking about the building of the tabernacle. And David's mistake would lead to the building of the temple in the same place. But what is the temple? The temple is the people of God. It's, it's the place, it was the house where God came, where he, we can have an encounter with him. Well, guess what? The, the tabernacles and the temples are a shadow of you and me. We are going to become the tabernacle of the Lord. Okay? And <clears throat> so all this has to do with the building up of this tabernacle. Okay? So even all of our mistakes and everything, okay, are going to end up building God's temple. Now, uh, I'll get to that in a moment. But I want you to see the importance of what was going on here. When God counts in the, sen in the census, he's thinking about <clears throat> every person being uh, redeemed so that they can be, they can build, they can be raised up to be a part of this tabernacle. They're building a tabernacle. Okay, actually I have the quote in here. Look on page one in your notes. It was in 1 Chronicles 21. One to fifteen. I think we need to look at it. I, I wasn't planning on looking at it, but the Holy Spirit is like, you know, going in this direction. Okay, so Second Chronicles. How many of us go into Second Chronicles? We need to. It's so loaded up with stuff. And it's First Chronicles. Chronicles. It's First Chronicles. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, mistake. First Chronicles. Thank Chapter you. Chapter twenty-one. <coughs> yeah. See, even with glasses, I can't read. Let's <laughs> say. Okay, we see in the spirit. Okay. Let's look at it. Uh, Satan stood up against Israel and moved David to number Israel. So now you know that what I was saying was not something I was saying, it's in the scriptures. So David said to Yoab, to the princes of the people, go number Israel from Beersheba to Don and bring me word that I may know their number. Yoaz said, may the Lord add to his people a hundred times as many as they are. But the, my Lord, the king, are they not all the Lord's servants? So actually Yoab, Joab was right. He was saying they're all owned by the Lord. They're all his servants. So what are you trying to count? Why does my Lord seek this thing? Why should he be the cause of guilt to Israel? Israel. Nevertheless, the king's word prevailed against Joab. Therefore, Joab departed and went throughout all Israel and came to Jerusalem. And Joab gave the number of the census to, of all the people of Israel. And all Israel was 1,100,000 men who drew the sword. And Judah was 470,000 men who drew the sword. But he did not number Levi and Benjamin among them, for the king's command was abhorrent. To Yoab, so he didn't know, he didn't listen to the king. He don't want to be totally disobedient. Now, why did he? <clears throat> the Lord spoke to Gad, David's seer, saying, "Go and speak to David, saying, Thus says the Lord: I offer you three things. Choose for yourself which one of them that I will do to you." In other words, Gad the prophet's coming along because you sinned against me. I'm going to give you three ways to die. So God, Gad came to David and said to him, Thus says the Lord, take for yourself either three years of famine, three months to be swept away before your foes, while the sword of your enemy overtakes you, or else three days of the sword of the Lord, even pestilence in the land, and the angel of the Lord destroying throughout all the territory of Israel. <clears throat> now therefore consider what answer I shall return to him who sent me. David said to Gad, I am in great distress. He put himself in great distress. Please let me fall into the hand of the Lord, for his mercies are very great. But do not let me fall into the hand of man. See, because of that, in his humility, he chose God's judgment, not, not the enemy to have the victory. So the Lord sent a pestilence on Israel. 70,000 men of Israel died. That's a lot of people. And God sent an angel to Jerusalem to destroy it. But as he was about to destroy it, 
The Lord saw and was very sorry over the calamity and said to the destroying angel, It is enough. Now relax your hand. And the angel of the Lord was standing by the threshing floor of Ornan, the Jebusite. Okay, and David lifted up his eyes and saw the angel of the Lord standing between earth and heaven and his drawn sword in his hand and stretched out over Jerusalem. Then David and the elders covered with sackcloth fell on their faces. And David said to God, is it not I who commanded to count the people? Indeed, I am the one who has sinned and done very wickedly. But these sheep, what have they done? O oh Lord, my God, please let your hand be against me and my father's household, but not against the people that they should be plagued. And the angel of the Lord commanded God to say to David, then David, that David should go up and build an altar to the Lord on the threshing floor of Ornan, the Jebusite. So David went up to the, by the word of God and he spoke in the name of the Lord. And basically, so on and so forth. He purchases this place, which is a temple mound today. The Jews own three places by deed, alone, let alone by God saying, I give it to you. They own the city of Hebron. Mm -hmm. They own Ornan, the, the, I mean the, the temple mount. And I forgot what the third one was. Mm -hmm. The cave of Machpelah. Yeah, the cave, Abraham per purchased the cave of Machpelah, which is also in Hebron. Okay, but I think there's one more, but I can't remember right now. But let me tell you something. If you look, if you go to Israel, you will see that this is the areas that the Palestinians want total control over. Because it's demonic. It is demonic that they want it. It's the clear owned by Israel sites that they want the most. Because they're wicked. They're evil. And those places should mostly be owned by Israel. They shouldn't even have one Palestinian there. There isn't such a thing as a Palestinian in the first place. Okay? Because that's all... That was, they, uh, that was a Roman thing. They renamed the land when Israel was forbidden there. They renamed it Philistina. Because the worst enemies of Israel were the Philistines. So later, in the English, it became Palestina. Palestine. But it was never that. It was, an, a, it was a mockery of the Romans to call it Philistina, Palestina. There is no Palestine. There never was. But anyhow, aside from that, let's get on to this. <coughs> okay. Uh, okay, now... now what was used for the tent on the bottom of page two? Actually, Exodus 30, 17 to 21. What, what is being planned on being built right now is talking, of, what we're talking about is what's called the key or the wash basin. Okay, we're back to the tabernacle. Remember last week we talked about the tabernacle? We're getting back to the tabernacle now. Okay, remember the tabernacle is a type of shadow of us. And it's also about our intimate relationship with the Lord. I'm sorry for any of you that might not remember uh, from what I, I taught last week. But basically, that everything in the tabernacle is about what Messiah did for us. Everything is about our relationship to him. Well, let's now go to the wash basin. Okay, first, when you enter the tabernacle, the whole thing, you come to the altar. Messiah is the sacrifice at the altar. Every sacrifice that was done on the altar was a type of shadow of Messiah, of Yeshua. Jesus, our Messiah. And right in between the altar and the tent in the tabernacle, there was a tent, was, was what's called the kior, the wash basin. And it was made of the Nehoshet, which comes from Nehusha, okay? And it literally means copper, it could be bronze. But if you go down even further to the root, you know what you get to? The snake. The snake. The word for snake is Nehosh. Okay? Uh, so ultimately, flesh is, is like a snake. 
Okay, there's nothing good in, in the flesh. So copper and bronze is the metal that was made that actually means like flesh. Okay, so. Uh, so the wash basin was a flesh made of, of a metal, the bronze metal. Now, what, what's a, its purpose? Okay, well, it says here, they shall wash Aaron and his sons their hands and their feet. Okay, uh, hands, as I was sharing before in the, in the Shema, hands are, are for serving the Lord. Hands are not for serving ourselves, they're for serving the Lord. Okay, so remember in John 13, 5 to 17. Uh, let's, let's go to that. John 13, 5 to 17. By the way, don't be overwhelmed by all the notes. Uh, we're probably not going to go through all of them. It's like 13 pages. John 13, 5? John 13, starting in verse 5. <coughs> um, when they reached... Oh, I'm in Acts. It doesn't work. John 13, okay. <coughs> when they poured water, when they poured water into the basin and began to wash... Uh, I'm sorry, when he, when Yeshua, poured water into the basin and began to wash his disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel with which he was girded. Remember, this is on the night of the Seder, of the last Seder, what, they, what the world calls, calls uh, the Last Supper. Uh, he came to Shimon Kepha, Simon Peter, and he said to him, Lord, do you wash my feet? And Yeshua answered and said to him, what, what I do... You do not realize now, but you will understand hereafter. Kepha said to him, Never shall you wash my feet. Yeshua answered him, If I do not wash you, you have no part with me. Shimon Kepha said to him, Lord, then wash not only my feet, but also my hands and my head. Yeshua said to him, He who is bathed needs only to wash his feet, to be, but is completely clean, and you are clean, but not all of you. Because we know he was talking about, he was talking about Judas who would betray him. Okay, so, uh, <clears throat> so Yeshua was using his hands to wash his his Tommy Dean his his disciples' feet, and Kepha and the others did not understand the spirit of the Torah. They understood the activity of a priest to a degree, because every priest would do this. They would wash their hands and their feet. It even said in the scriptures, you do not understand now, but you will know after this. Our hands represent strength, support, and the portion that comes from God. When we raise up our hands, we do it in surrender, in sacrifice. When we raise up our hands to him. <coughs> now, the, the, do you notice the Hebrew word? For, uh, for feet is regal. Have you ever heard the word regal? It's royalty, right? That's the Hebrew word for feet. It's regal. You guys are royal because you stand on your feet. For the Lord, that is. Okay? The feet is our authority. The hands is our strength. It's our, is our portion from God. And our feet is our authority. We are to walk righteously. Okay. <coughs> our feet are supposed to be used for spreading the good news of the kingdom. Amen. Our feet are shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace, according to the word. Okay, now. <coughs> Excuse me. In ancient times, when you were coming up to the tabernacle, or later the Jewish temples, it is like being, it's like being an unbeliever and becoming born again at the altar of sacrifice. Yeshua spilled his blood, and the spilling of his blood is at the cross is the way the altar is. 
It's, a, it's, it's the way the altar looks. Okay, you, you have a place where you offer up certain parts of the animal. And you have certain other sections where wood is burning. And in parts where wood isn't burning. Okay, it's a big altar. Okay, and so the, the altar itself is a, is a type and shadow of the cross. Okay, so between the altar and the Oh Hell Moe, I'm going to tell you, teach you a few Hebrew words here. The tent of meeting, there's the tent in the middle of the tabernacle. The, between the altar and the tent of meeting is a wash basin or a labor. The next step of our faith, after we receive Messiah at the cross, every one of us have to receive him as our Passover lamb, the cross. So we, we are at the altar, right? But now we're moving on from the altar because he has died for us. Okay, the next step of our faith when we believe to salvation is the water mikvah, our baptism, our immersion. Listen, I can't tell you this enough, but if you haven't been baptized, it, this is really symbolic of dying, of making a commitment. When you first believe, you really should get baptized. Even if you do it on your own, you get your bathtub in your house and you put yourself completely under and come back up. It's really important to go under when you first believe. It has nothing to do with the Baptist church, okay? They, they've taken it and they turned it into a whole doctrinal statement. But reality is, it's we have to do that because it's a picture of us saying, we, are, we, have been, we believed in him and now we're going to die to us and live for him. And that's why we come up. Okay, and that's the next step. That's why there's a water basin there. That's why there's a water basin right between the altar and the tent. It's a shadow for us of what God's plan to do with all of us. Okay, so this is symbolic of giving our flesh to him, and we say we are choosing to die to the will of the flesh to be resurrected to the will of the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit. So this is the full meaning of the wash basin or the labor. And later, when they had the temples, they had a big water thing there. I think that with Solomon, he had a bunch of uh, bronze images of cows all around the whole thing. It was beautiful. You should see some of the pictures that the Jews have drawn about that to show, to show how the city was. It was like a huge pool of water, but it had the same purpose. It was representative. A representative of dying for ourselves. Do you know that, that the mikvah, which is the Hebrew way of saying immersion or baptism, that that they had it in ancient times because they they sacrifices could never permanently get rid of sin. So you had to keep getting baptized over and over again when you were bringing an offering up. And also women, when they were coming out of that unclean period, they they would have to wash in a mikvah. It's all symbolic of washing away the effects of death from us through and rising up, uh, having a new life. And this is happening even today among the Orthodox Jews. They will bathe before certain ceremonies, even the rabbis. They, it's very holy, this whole thing with the, with the mikvah. It has to do with dying, dying to yourself. But for us, if we confess our sins, if we make a mistake, if we fail and we fall, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins. But you know what? There's still some sins that we do that we have to wash. Okay? And uh, I believe even in heaven, when we get there, we're going to all have to wash because our souls are damaged from this life. And I believe even when we get to heaven, uh, we're going to have to wash again. But it's not going to be a water lake like it is down here. So, <coughs> okay. The next thing. Uh, we're in Shemot 30, 22 to 33. <coughs> you know what? I'm just going to cover the spices, okay? Well, you can look at, we'll, we'll read the scriptures later or read it on your own. The word for spices is basam. Uh, so they were supposed to gather together. God was going to anoint two leaders. 
We'll talk about that more next week, probably. One is being Betzalel, and the other is that Aholi, uh, Aholus. Aholiav. Aholiav, thank you, Aholiav. Okay, and there's a revelation in those two that connect us to the two witnesses, but uh, we'll talk about that another time. Uh, but now we're talking about the preparation of the anointing oil for the, for the priest, for the whole Mishkan. The Mishkan is, is the tabernacle. They were about to, God was telling them they needed to create an oil, that a specific compound of oil that was going to be used to anoint everything, every priest, all the tabernacle, okay? And in the scriptures it says, you will not make this for yourselves. Listen, if you know any Christian, any believer who feel like, oh, I have to have the holy anointing oil that was used on the tabernacle, I would advise them against it. Taking this mixture and mixing it according to the word of God is a dangerous thing. It's a sin. God said it's not supposed to happen. However, they use us to anoint the tabernacle, and we are the tabernacle. <laughs> so there's two sides to that, but I'll give that to you. <laughs> okay, you choose. Okay, but it was for the Mishkan. So... Basically, if you're going to do this and you're going to use this anointing oil, you better mean what you do. In other words, you can't play games with the tabernacle. You can't play games with the anointing oil. If you're going to apply this combo com compound of anointing oil, then you better be living the way you're supposed to or there's going to be consequences. You're going to become the tabernacle or else. <laughs> Not trying to scare you or anything. We just have to respect the things of God. Okay. Uh, okay. So there, there were different spices. <clears throat> One of them is myrrh. Uh, myrrh is bitter. Okay. Uh, <laughs> I'm laughing because Mary actually brought us. She's been reading through the Torah this week. <laughs> She, she brought some of the anointing oils and some of the, the oils, okay? Uh, so we got myrrh, which means bitterness, and it was supposed to be pure. I'm sorry. Uh, it was supposed to be pure and also cinnamon that is fragrant. See? Cinnamon is old. It's an old spice, okay? But a good one. An oldie, but a good. Okay. And then, <laughs> and then it was cane. Fragrant cane. The word kana. Or kane, kane. Okay, cinnamon is called kinamon. See, actually, that's the Hebrew way of saying cinnamon. So cinnamon has kept its closeness to the Hebrew language. Because it's liberty. Yeah, huh? cinnamon. Liberty. Cinnamon, but it's kinamon. And actually, if you say the C, because it's pronounced with a C, right? It's actually, if you pronounce it with a K, you'd be saying it right. Kinamon. Kinam kinamon, actually. Kinamon. kinamon. Right now it's very expensive. <laughs> yeah, not very expensive. Uh, then kesha, well, actually in Hebrew, it's the word kida. And the oil itself, the word for oil is shemen. <coughs> okay, and then you're supposed to have olives in it. Okay, olives. It's the word zit. That's kind of nowhere near. Actually, zayit. Zayit. Olives. Okay. So let's break this down. Okay. Uh, where it says commentary on page six. I hope you don't mind. We're going to stay a little late. We got started a little late. Okay. So if you just want to leave, go ahead. But I'm going to continue. <laughs> okay. Myrrh is to be a free man in Messiah. Strengthened through the bitterness of life and still choosing to live for him. Okay, now why am I sharing about the meaning of these spices? Because are you anointed in Messiah? Are you anointed in him? Are you a priest and a king of Messiah? Then this is your anointing. I'm going to describe to you in all the items that's used to create the compound how this is you. 
So you are the verb. You're free in Messiah. And because you've gone through bitterness in your life, and you're, you're still choosing to live for him, you are exhibiting the verb in your life. So please, I don't want you to look at all the negative stuff, all the terrible stuff, all the bitterness that you went through in this life as being bad. God has made you into a special compound of anointing. Cinnamon. Cinnamon is the stand for Messiah because everything about Kinemon or Kinemon is to stand. It means to stand. Remember? Just look at your notes. Everything about it is flowing, is lip, I'm sorry, uh, is fragrant. It literally means to stand erect on the origin. Okay? Cain, so what, is, what are we to do? We're to stand in the Lord? Stand on him. Stand on the rock. Cain, Cain that was used is to be redeemed by Messiah, being balanced in the truth of knowledge and wisdom. We receive an inheritance from Elohim. And it means someone possessing. Think about that. So that's Cain. It means to create. It means to possess. It means to acquire. It means to be balanced. Okay? So, so if you're balanced for God, if you have a balance of, of wisdom, if, I'm sorry, you have a balance uh, and you possess, you possess wisdom, you possess knowledge, Okay, this is all part of the Cain. And I'm not talking about Cain and Cain and Abel. I'm talking about this, the Cain here, the, the spice. Okay. All right, acacia uh, is the next one. Remember, acacia is the word kid, kidda. It means, its root word means to bow down. Okay, so acacia is a man with a broken and contrite heart. He bows down. To respect God in humility. He bows down. He's humble before the Lord. Are you humble before the Lord? Because if you are, you have one of the spices of the compound. Okay? The last one is the oil of olive, the zit, or zit, zayi. Oil of olive is the fruitfulness of the life of a believer in Messiah. So this is what makes us shine. Because the purpose of the olives is to create oil to, for brightness. You shine for the Lord. You know what? I think every one of us exhibits all these. I mean, at least, or tries to. But I'll tell you something. If we want to do something opposite of this, we're losing our anointing. You want to have the anointing oil applied to you? Then these are the characteristics of you have an anointing on you. You have a question? Okay. Are you all following me okay? All right. Everything in the tabernacle tent in the wilderness, including the priests, were anointed with this compound. It was never to be reproduced or used by any other purpose or any other person, even the children of Israel, not of the Kohenim, not of the priests. But remember, everything in Israel was a type of shadow. We are all supposed to be priests and kings of the Messiah, so therefore this anointing all can be applied. But spiritually, when you are exhibiting the spiritual <laughs> aspects of these spices, you already have the spices. You're already spiced up. Okay, now, now that we've talked about that, let's talk about, <coughs> let's, let's read from uh, Exodus 30, 34 to 38. We're about half done. No, I'm only kidding. Uh, 30. <clears throat> you know what? Uh, we're probably not going to go over all this, so I'll, I'll try it, okay? Yehovah said to Moshe, take for yourself spices stacked. Uh, okay, I'm going to say the Hebrew word because I'm not very good with the English one. Uh, it says anika, or uh, how do you say it? Onka. Onka. In Hebrew, it's the word ush. Chelet. Uh, that's galvanum. Uh, spices. Uh, Samin. Ul Bona, which is frankincense. Zakar, that is pure. Of equal weight they shall be. And you shall make it into 
incense, a spice compound, the craft of a perfumer, and thoroughly mixed pure and holy, you shall grind some of the finely, and you shall place some of it before the testimonial tablets in the tent of meeting, where I shall designate a time to meet you there. Holies of holies, it shall remain for you. Okay. The, the incense that you shall make, according to its formulation, you shall not make for yourselves. Holy, it shall remain for you, for Yehovah. Anyone who makes it like it, makes it like to smell it, shall be cut off from his people. <laughs> so that's serious, okay? Well, <clears throat> I'm going to go over this. I'm going to speed this up real quick. Okay, the word for spices is basam. It's a sweet-smelling aroma. So let's look at what makes up these spices. Stat, nata. It's like gumdrops, <laughs> according to this. It means to prophesy, to preach, to discourse, to speak. Then an an anaka or she shechelet, shechelet, shechelet. It's an ingredient used in the holy incense, and I might have the meaning of it. I don't have the meaning of that one. Okay. Uh, okay. This is all I got. Okay. Do you see on the bottom of page six? Uh, it says it means peeling off by a concussion of sound. <coughs> okay, so we'll just keep that. There's not too many that uh, meanings to, to that to that one. Okay, galvanum, which is hel bana, means a resin or gum, and it means the fat, the choices, the best part, the very best. Okay, and the last one is frankincense, which is levona which means white, to be made pure, white. Okay, so, uh, you shall make it into an incense, a spice compound, thoroughly mixed. Go to page eight. <clears throat> pure, holy, and grounded up. Okay, let's break this down. Okay, uh, a lot of this is new here. I want you to, to take a look at this. We're on page 8. What we have from all this is a representation of us and our prayers. Remember, this is the incense. The incense altar is a symbolic of our prayer. So now, this is going to tell us something about the kind of prayer life God wants in his people. Okay? So... The incense altar is the place of our prayers. The incense compound mixture is our prayers. It is our prayers. How does Elohim see it? How does God see it? It is to him a sweet-smelling aroma made up of equal amounts of prophetic words. Now pay attention to this. This is from the stack. Just from the stack alone. This is going to tell us something about what our prayers are made up of. Now get this. Equal amount of prophetic words, words of knowledge. Did we not experience that today? This is what it's all about. Okay. Torah teaching, what I'm sharing with you, and scriptures, which Maria gave the scripture. Okay. And, uh, and others gave scriptures. Okay. So the loudness, now the anaka is the loudness of our authority and the loud cry of our heart. Listen, when, when I love it, when Laura prays out loud and she sings out loud, she is exhibiting the incense on a. I hate using the English one, but you know, I can't think of it right off my head right now, but it's right there in your notes. Okay. Uh, that's when we pray, pray out loud. Get loud. God loves it. Because you're using your vocal cords. You, you're meaning it. You know, if you just say quietly, oh Lord, I'm, I'm distressed by the troubles of my life. You know, or you could do it real loud and say, Abba, help! Thank you, Lord. Yes, you brought me through distresses and I've overcome and helped me to deal with my issues. Yeah. Loud. We Jews are loud people. Okay, get loud. <coughs> like the Anaka. It's offering, and now get this, it's offering up the best that we can give in our prayers. That's what the Anaka means, the best we can give. Not being weak, lazy, or limiting our time. Okay, 
Not being lazy, we are living our time. Uh, actually, I, I got it all mixed up here. Okay, we give in our prayers. We are not weak, we are not lazy, we don't limit our time. We are not impatient, and that's what the Galva moon re represents. Okay, let's, let me go back to the Galva moon. Okay. Galva moon means the very best. I, I was wrong. I said the very best was the Anaka. The loudness, and the loudness of our authority is the Anaka. The very best that we give, when we give everything in our prayer, is the Galva moon. Okay, do you understand that? Are you following, please? Let me know. Yes. Okay. Uh, I'm sharing a lot of information. And finally, white purity, the frankincense, is the white purity. Okay? And you can see that in, in Sefer Chazon, or the book of Revelation 5, 8, and 8, 3, and 4. Okay, so these are the ingredients that go into the process to make the incense. Okay, and, <clears throat> it, and the process of making the incense is is a whole other thing. You can get into that on your own. Okay. The anointing for righteous people, the rest of the children of Israel, Kohanim. The anointing oil is not reproduced, and neither is the incense used in the prayers. Okay. Now, now all that to say, God wants us to have a prayer life. And these are the elements of it. God doesn't want us to be soft and gentle and just say a few things. Oh, this is what I need, Lord. He wants more. He wants more from us. Okay. Uh, yes? And this cannot be borrowed. Huh? This cannot be borrowed. When we have a, uh, I, I, this, this time I learned that whenever we seek the Lord, it's like the, the oil that the Lord is putting on us, that we, we are filling ourselves with anointing and it cannot be borrowed because when the Lord comes, nobody can is going to be able to borrow it from other people. Right. That's very good. You know, and not only that, I want you to imagine that you yourself are in the tabernacle and you're in the holy place and you're at the incense altar. Because that's what it's supposed to be like. Think about it. You have on the left, you have the Holy Spirit, you have the menorah. We have the Holy Spirit, right? And on the right, you have, you have the, uh, the table of the faces, the word of God. And you have the incense altar, your prayer. This is the secret place. This is the tabernacle, the tent of the tabernacle. Okay? All right, so all this, <coughs> Moses, God is telling Moses, this is what you're supposed to do. He's given the description of the lot. He's given the description of all the elements of the tabernacle. And then he finishes with a wash basin, and he finishes with uh, the, the elements of the incense and the oil, what they're made of. This is God. All this is Moses on top of the mountain, the first time. So all this is happening, and God is speaking and telling him all this while he's writing the Ten Commandments on, on stone that God chiseled out, and then, he, and then God wrote with his finger on it. Okay, so what are the people doing? It's now come to the end. He's about to bring the table, the tables, uh, the tablets of the, of the covenant down. And <coughs> something terrible happens. So let's go through this. I'll try to do this really quick because I know it's late. Okay. Uh, <coughs> Aharon and the children, it's on your notes, page 9. Aharon and the children of Israel built the golden calf. They used their jewelry from Jehovah's conquering of Egypt to build the golden calf as Aaron dictated for them to do. Aaron pointed to the calf and said, These are your gods that freed you from Egypt, O Israel. Aaron built the altar to place the calf on. Aaron proclaimed the festival to Jehovah to be on the next day, later to be called the 17th of Tammuz. No wonder the 17th of Tammuz is a very bad fast day. We all know about it. Fein Hamsarim. Okay, it's very bad fast day. Uh, this happens in the summer. This is a celebration of false feasts. Okay, we're gonna get it. I'm gonna get to the meaning of this. Moshe pleaded on this day, on the 17th of Tammuz, because Jehovah told Moses what his people were doing, and Jehovah was going to destroy them. Okay, 
Number seven, Moses comes down with the first set of two tablets inscribed on both sides by Yehovah. Moshe saw the golden calf and heard shame-filled celebration, and Moses' anger flared up and he threw the first tablets from his hand, shattering the first tablets at the foot of Mount Sinai. Okay? The shattering is the word shavar, to break in pieces. He took the calf and burned it with fire, page 10. He grounded up the, the calf fine and dispersed it over the surface of the water, and he made the children of Israel drink it. They drank their sin. Aaron pleaded with Moses and explained what happened. And Moses stood at the gateway of the camp and said, Whoever is for Yehovah, come to me. All the sons of, of Levi gathered to him. Moshe then commanded the sons of Levi to kill among the children of Israel, and they killed. And, and that was 3,000 men of Israel, the children of Israel, died. The sons of Le Levi did the judgment upon the children of Israel. The next day, Moses ascended the mountain to seek atonement for the children of Israel for the golden calf. And Jehovah struck the people with a plague. Okay, so it goes on and on. Okay, Jehovah said to, to Moses to lead the people to the land and that he would send an angel to go with them to the land. But he would not go with them lest he kill them along the way. The people removed their jewelry by Moses' instructions and Moses pleaded before Jehovah again as the people mourned because th because of how Jehovah felt about being about their being stiff-necked, and that he would annihilate them if he, if he went with them. Moshe pitched his tent, called the tent a meeting. He pitched his tent. Now pay attention, there was no tabernacle yet. It hadn't been built, it was only talked to from God to Moses. He told him what it was going to be, but it, it wasn't pitched yet. His tent became the tent of meeting. So <clears throat> he pitched it, out of the camp. I want you to imagine the whole uh, Israel's mourning. Everyone, because every one of their families had someone who died at the hands of the Levites because God commanded it. Otherwise, God would have destroyed them all. Okay? The, the tent where God's glory was was at a distance, outside the camp. And if someone wanted to go to God, they had to go outside the camp to get there. Now, Joshua was always in there, in there. I want you to understand Joshua's heart. Moses represents God. Joshua represents the Messiah. And here is God. The Father is in the tent, and so is the Messiah. And the glory represents the Holy Spirit. So all this is in this tent of Moses that Moses had, his house, his tent. Okay, and after he's pleading for Israel, I'm, I'm just going to go over this right now and kind of preach this. After, after all this, and he pleads for Israel, and God says, now I want you yourself to cut out another set of tablets. Okay, and, and bring it up to the mountain. So here he was on the mountain 40 days, on the ground 40 days, in his tent, and then 40 days, he, he's going to go back up the mountain. But you know what Moses says? He says, I, I, I can't take what these people are doing, what they're doing to you. God was so zealous. I mean, Moses was so zealous for God. And I can't take what they're doing. Listen, I need to see your glory. I need to see your glory. I need to have my focus on you. I'm so angry at the people. I need to have my focus on you. I need to see you. I'm not happy. I want to see you. And that's what happened. God told him, because you want to see me, I'm going to show you all of myself. I can't show you my front part, because if I show you my front part, you will die. No man can see me and live. My face. Okay, so, so he goes back up. <clears throat> and... Um, Let's go down to page 11. Go to page 11. Moshe, this is in chapter 33, 18 to 22. Let's read this. <coughs> Thank you all for staying and sticking with this because all of this is important. All of this. 
but find out our place that we are the tabernacle and also the the the, the glory that fills the tabernacle. That's that's what this is about. Um, okay, so he was up there. You know, he was on the ground forty days and forty nights from Tammuz eighteen to the month of Av, the last day of the month of Av. So on the first day of Elul, he goes back up on the mountain and he comes down on Yom Kippur. Okay, and this is what happens. And this is what's going to happen. Uh, chapter 33, 18. I can find it. Okay, here we go. <coughs> he said, this is Moses. He said, he said to the Father, show me now your glory. He said, I shall cause to pass all my goodness before your face. And I shall call out with the name of Jehovah before you. And I shall show favor to whomever I shall I, I choose to show favor, and I shall show mercy to whomever I choose to show mercy. He said, You will not be able to see my face, for he cannot see me. No man can and live. And Jehovah said, There is a place near me. You should be stand you should stand waiting on the rock. Messiah is the rock. It shall be that when my glory passes, I shall place you in the cleft of the rock, and I shall shield with my hand over you until I have passed. Then I shall remove my hand, and you will see my back, but my face may not may not be seen. And Jehovah, you know, did that. You know, that would happen later on. <coughs> so he told him. Jehovah said to Moses, carve for yourself two tablets of stone like the first ones. Now listen to this. Pay attention to this. And I shall inscribe. This is God talking, the Father. I shall inscribe on the tablets the words that were on the first tablets which you shattered. Be prepared for the morning. You should go up in the morning to Mount Sinai, and you shall stand waiting for me there on top of the mountain. Okay, now, what is the purpose? Uh, God's glory will be passing. What is the purpose of all this? He goes up the first time. God writes. He he, he writes the ten. He chisels out the stone. He writes the Ten Commandments down. The ten words. And he smashes them upon the golden calf. They, he makes the people, they, they turn it to dust, the golden calf, and makes the people drink it. Yeshua came the first time to be shattered, to be destroyed. He is the word of God. Destroyed. You understand? He is the first tablets. But here's the thing. He's the second tablets, too. The difference is, he is the resurrected Messiah. He is the Messiah full of light and love. He is coming again in glory. Like Moses was in glory. Let's look at that. After, after all this had happened, God shows himself to Moses. And what happens? Moses lights up like a, a volcano. Not in, a, in a, not in a bad way of explosion, like anger or anything. I mean, he is bright. He is glorious. Okay, let's go to... Let's find this, the place where it's at. <clears throat> uh, okay, he has to come down and he has to put a veil over him. Okay, the veil is because he's shining so brightly that the people are afraid. Okay, let's look at the last part of this Torah portion. Moshe finished speaking, speaking with them, and he placed on his face a mask. When Moses would come before Yehovah to speak to him, he would remove the mask until he left, and then he would go out and speak to the children of Israel 
that which he had commanded. They saw the children of Israel, saw the face of Moses that had become radiant, had his skin, the skin of his face of Moses. Moshe would return the mask onto his face until he came to speak with him. In other words, he's the glory shone upon his face. Now, when Moses came down, that glory was seen upon him. What day did he come down? On Yom Kippur. Messiah is coming back on Yom Kippur. And it says they will look upon him whom they have pierced. So Moses, Moses is a type, Moshe is a type and shadow of Messiah at his second coming. When he appeared, when that glory was upon his face. Because the day that he came down was the same day that Yeshua will return to the earth. When all the nation will be forgiven on the day of atonement. What was he coming back with? Another set of tablets. But these set of tablets were a little bit different. It was God's finger who wrote on them, but it was also Moses who wrote on them. How is that possible? I don't know. But it says it. I, I was looking at it. I, I, I never quite understood it. I never quite saw it before. But it actually says that... <coughs> Look at verse 28 of chapter 34 of Exodus. He was there with, with uh, Yehovah for 40 days and 40 nights. This is the second time. Bread he did not eat and water he did not drink and wrote. And he wrote. Now the word he wrote there is capitalized. So it's referring to God. Wrote on the tablets the words of the covenant and the Ten Commandments. And it was on the descent of Moses from Mount Sinai with the two tablets with the testimony in his hand. And the hand of Moses said, he descended from the mountain. Moses did it. not, he didn't know that it became radiant at the skin of his face. But actually, that's not, that's not the one I wanted to show you. Hold on. It actually says that, that um, he wrote too. Verse 27. Okay, here we go. It's, I was, I was one verse late. Uh, verse 27 of chapter 34. Yehovah said, to Moses, write for yourself these words, for according to these words, I have established with you a covenant and with Israel. Okay, so he said, write for yourself these words. But also, God was the one that wrote on them. So somehow, he was writing the words, and also God himself. So they were both writing on this. So what does that mean? These second tablets were chiseled out by, by Moses. He wrote on them, and God wrote on them. Okay, how does that apply to us? Because on the first set, God wrote on them. He chiseled out the stone. He wrote on them, and it was smashed. God sent his son, who was smashed for us. God did all the work. But this time, when we believe, we have to choose him. And we have to chisel out the stone. We're the ones that are going to take the word to ourselves. We're with our choice. It's his second coming. It's being ready. It's having the Holy Spirit. It's our choice. And we write. And God writes with us. And we're together. And this, the second tablets are the same commandments. But it's by spirit. It's by the spirit. So the first set is Messiah and his death. Taking our sins away. Where was it thrown at? It was thrown at the worst sin in all of Israel's history, the golden calf. He covered the sins, but it, it was a lot of death involved. Just as there was a lot of death involved with Yeshua at the cross. When he comes back, there's no death involved. There's no one that dies. When Moses comes down on the mount, because he comes to bring life. He comes to, to bring atonement. He comes to bring a set of tablets that will never be destroyed. And they were never destroyed. They disappear. But a lot of people think that they are hidden there. Somewhere in that ark. When Jeremiah hit them, so were the table, tablets of the covenant. They're around somewhere. And one day we're going to see them. But right now, they will not be destroyed. They are a re perfect representation of Yeshua. Jesus on the side. Okay, so... The glory. This whole 
representation of the second tablets is the glory of God, is what God wants with us. He wants to fill us, to overflow us. He says, I come for the hearts. I come to write on the tablets of your heart. He, when that Torah was given on, at, at, on that same mountain where, where the, ta- where the, uh, the, the, um, where the, uh, the temples were, when the Torah came down into the hearts of the believers in the first century, on the same day, Shavuot, that the Torah was given on Mount Sinai, his Torah was written on hearts of flesh inside of us. It's the second set. Although it was the day of the same day as the first set, this was now the new covenant. And Messiah had come and he resurrected. And we are now bearers of that second covenant, of the new covenant, of the better covenant. And when he comes again, we receive him. The people that are going to receive him are going to be the people that hadn't received him yet. But for us, we're going to be with him. Coming When he comes back the second time, we're going to be just like Moses. We're going to be with, like Moses on the mountain coming down in glory. We are going to come down in glory with our face lit up, everything lit up about us with Messiah when he comes. That's what all this is about. That's what this whole Torah portion is about. The veil is only for those who are living in flesh. Yehovah, Yehovah, El Rahum, Vichanun, Eret, Hapayim, Rav Chesed, Be'emet, No Tzer Chesed, La'ala, Fi, No Se, Avon, Vif, Asha, Vichata, A, Vinake, Lo, Vinake, Poked, Avon, Avot, Al, Vanim, Va'al, Vinay, Vanim, Al, Shilashim, Va'al, Rebe'im. Yehovah passed before his face and called out, Yehovah, Yehovah, God did this. El, compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and abundant in kindness and truth. That's the word that emet there. Preserver of kindness for thousands of generations, forgiver of iniquity, willful sin is forgiven, and inadvertent sin, and who absolves, but does not absolve completely, remembering the iniquity of our fathers upon the children and upon the children of children and upon the third generation and upon the fourth generation. He will, he's already forgiven our suitable letter to Shua. It's only upon the wicked is that he remembers the sin. Chesed. He's poured his chesed on us. Abba, I ask him, name me Yeshua, Lord. That you just keep pouring your chesed, your mercy upon us. Abba, we are, we are sinners saved by grace. Thank you, Abba, that you are saving us. That, that we're, never, we're not going to stop being in the process of salvation until the day of your return. You said, he who endures to the end will be saved. May we be counted to, to, as those who endure to the end. Abba, use us. Help us to be a witness, Abba, to the lost sheep out there. The lost sheep of the house of Israel, Lord. I ask, Lord, that we would be a witness to the Jewish community. I ask, Lord, that we would be a witness, Lord, to, <coughs> to the non-Jews, Abba, to return to the first love of the word of God, to return to the first love in the spirit of those who worship you in spirit and in truth. Abba, I ask, Lord, that people will return to the intimacy with you, Lord, that even I would return to the fullness of the intimacy that you have. Each of us, Lord, you have made like a tabernacle. Abba, may we be glowing, Lord. Cause us to glow in your presence, to be lit up in your presence, Abba, so that we can come and be with you soon as you come, Lord, that you can't take your bride, and then we can come with you back to the earth and see all of Israel Look upon you who may have pierced and be saved, Abba. And then we could be joined and physical Israel could be one with spiritual Israel. And you will have a one new man and a whole new creation. And it may be Yeshua, Lord. And Abba, I ask, Lord, that you seal this instruction inside of our hearts, Abba. And I, and I ask that you have your way in us, Lord. We don't want to follow our way. We know that we can't do anything right. We want to do everything right for your kingdom. We don't want to be used by you. We want to be in the middle of what you're doing in this hour, Abba. You're doing so many things. We want to, we want to take our part in the work that you called your bride, your, your body to do in this hour. And it may be Yeshua. <coughs> Let's do the closing blessing.
it's on page 66. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who has given us the Torah of truth and has planted eternal life in our midst. Blessed are you, O Lord, giver of the Torah. Amen. Blessed are you, Yehovah Elohim, King of the universe, who brings forth bread from the earth. <coughs> and for the yain, I'll say yain. 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 That's how you say wine. Don't let anyone tell you you can't speak Hebrew. Amen. Blessed are you, Yehovah Elohim, King of the Universe, who brings forth fruit from the vine. Amen. We close with the ironic benediction God told us to place uh, <coughs> his, his blessing upon the people. And you are all priests, so you need to learn this blessing. But you're going to pronounce this over others, even over your family. <coughs> it's supposed to be the name of God, but it's not perfect. One of these days I'll learn how to do it right. <laughs> The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his face upon you and give you peace. In the name of our Sar Shalom, our Prince of Peace, Yeshua HaMashiach, the soon coming King, the Olive and the Tav, the beginning and the end. Amen.